Hello. We are live. Woohoo! Hello, it's everyone. The Jessica <laughs> and Megan show. We're excited. Yay! <laughs> Today's topic is all about play. And Jessica, when you and I were chatting about this topic, I think it was, um, I don't know, a few months ago when you had said, gosh, I need more play in my life. Mm. And I said, oh, this would be a great Jessica and Megan show topic so that we can... Uh, we can really, I think as women, we have a hard time thinking, how can I play and why should I play? And is that really the best use of my time as a business owner and blah, blah, blah. And so that was why we were like, ooh. And I said, ooh, I have the perfect person. And you said the same. And that is what birthed <laughs> this call. So Jess, do you want to say anything else as we intro this topic before we dive in? Yeah. Well, the only thing I was going to say is that actually several of my clients have said to me this week, I have a really hard time like being unproductive and allowing myself to like sit with space. And I, I think it's really interesting. I think it's not at all surprising because as high achieving women, we like to put a premium on everything that we do. We like to sort of be really like, I am so focused and I'm achieving all the time. And actually we get so into that that we can almost like lose a bit of our creativity and a bit of ourselves in the process so I know for me like this has absolutely been like a journey that I have been going on this year and Sarah I don't think you even know how much you've inspired me um, no. on this whole thing like I have literally been rediscovering my inner musician and I have like I made myself a little home studio and I've been no singing and like that so. makes me really happy <laughs> Brilliant. Shall we introduce our wonderful guest today, Megan? Yeah, why don't you start? So, like everyone, this is Sarah Gillespie. She is a musical legend with mm -hmm. just such an impressive like background of recording, performing. She's even in the studio as she speaks to us today. Um, but Sarah, you also are head of a community um, for men and women, or is it just, just mainly for women? Mainly for women, yeah. Yeah, of like inspiring women to reconnect with their like their creative side. Like, and there it's it's mainly sort of with music, but it's more than just music, isn't it? It's everything, it's art, it's poetry, whatever mm -hmm. that might look like for each individual person. Yep. Um, and it's so important. Like, is there anything that you would like to say sort of in addition to that to introduce yourself to us? Um, sure. I mean, thanks for that. But I, I'm, I'm in a studio in Notting Hill with Adele in the studio opposite over there. Um, That's so cool. Really funny. And um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, cra it's crazy. Uh, yeah, so, so the thing, so I have like four critically acclaimed albums and I've been touring for a lot of years. And uh, often I think when people have interviewed me, and ask me what influences me and what helps me write songs, what they're expecting me to, to do is list other songwriters that have all the same identity markers as me, for instance. But actually, the truth is that I was always inspired by visual art, poetry, um, literature, theatre, people I talk to in the street, uh, you know, creative thinkers, all sorts of things, philosophy. Um, and so... Um, I wanted in my community to create an environment where all of these things are, are like a 360 experience. And I would say that play is one of the most important aspects, not just in life, but also in business and also in our relationships and certainly when it comes to expressing ourselves. So it's um, it's vital in all sorts of ways. And it's so weird, isn't it? Because we know that like for children, like children learn through play. And it's like we almost get to a point of like, oh, like I don't need to do that anymore. Like I just have to be serious all the time. And I think I don't know if that's like a thing that we learn sort of in the corporate world that we find it very hard to let go of. But I think giving ourselves permission to like do stuff just for the fun of it, just for the enjoyment mm -hmm. and sort of do something without guaranteeing an outcome and just being like, what if I just do it because I'm doing it? So mm -hmm. I think yes. we're going to have an awesome conversation today. Yes, yes. And so uh, Dr. Minette Riordan is a dear friend of mine and has had a... Um, how do we say uh, she's been a solo, a solo serial entrepreneur for many, many years and is a PhD in Spanish. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Okay. An intellectual, a philosoph, a philosoph. I think of words in French. I can't even speak English anymore. Um, 
really had a, a wide variety in her career and was a business coach for a long time for creatives and had other businesses before that. And recently has not, has not been an artist her whole entire life. And that is a more recent discovery and then starting to integrate in her own life, regular creative play, which then helped her shift into more of her gifts and her genius and really mm -hmm. birthed this new Manette that then birthed a new business that she has created around personal growth through creativity. And I get goosebumps because the, the transformation that the work that she does with her clients now creates like a metamorphosis in her clients in a way that, you know, the seriousness of life can never do very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Manette, what would you like to add? Thank you. That was beautifully, beautifully said. And I think I have to own that I have been an artist my whole life oh. and a creative my whole life. But I did not self identify like that was the sticky wicket, right? Like calling myself an artist was a huge emotional transformation that sort of surprised me, right? That caught and the, the big turning point was when I started sharing my artwork on social media and people started asking to buy it. And I resisted for two years. I'm like, I'll just come by the house or pay the shipping and I'll send it to you. Like, I didn't feel like I wanted that to be a business selling and I still don't like it's really fun when I sell art but it's not my focus because I'm so committed to this piece about helping people rediscover who they are through creative play and it's fascinating to me how women resist play I had one person even say I hate play <laughs> I'm like how can you hate play right like and that as a um, with a, I have a PhD from Stanford, talk about like overworking a high achiever. That was totally who I was for so long until very recently. And learning that play is really the antidote to burnout. Rest mm -hmm. and play, not more doing, but simply resting and playing is the antidote to overwhelm, right? It's the antidote to just about everything that's bothering us. And I also think that a lot of times, we believe that personal development and growth and deep transformational work has to be hard work, but it can be playful. It can be deep and playful. And Diane Ackerman wrote a great book called Deep Play that was really, really insightful. And Jessica, you said something earlier. She talks about in the book how the more we need to learn as a species, the more we need to play. So think about tiger cubs or bear cubs and how they're learning to survive and thrive that the more they need to learn or in traditional cultures warriors learn to fight through play combat and i look at us in the global crises that seem to be rolling one after another and we need to learn to play in order to just i think survive everything that's going on around us but we make play so hard so i'm curious how other people on the call define play, like what does play mean? Like the formal definition is fascinating enough, but it wouldn't necessarily be my personal definition. Mm, well, yeah. I can say for myself that <clears throat> play for me personally is best expressed through improv and through comedy and through sketch comedy. That for me is the play language of my soul that I've discovered. I enjoy doing other forms of play, but uh, before, what I would tell myself is, well, gosh, I feel so serious when I get on stage and when I start to speak. Serious Megan turns on in this immediately. And for the, the two of you on the call who know me, I'm not a serious person very often. But when I get serious, it is like this other person takes over me who is not really me. And so for years, I told myself, well, gosh, I just have to deliver these fire hose speeches about, you know, to get into people's minds to benefit them in marketing. And it wasn't until I started playing and started using improv and using sketch comedy characters to teach that a people started learning a lot more. Mm -hmm. B mm -hmm. I started actually getting sales from using those characters and C my joy factor went through the, through the roof because it was like this expression of my soul was coming through in a way that was benefiting me so much. So that was my my own personal experience. What about you, Jess? I 
I am in the category of someone who has probably felt quite ambivalent about play for quite a long time. And I have definitely, I think that sometimes it's really hard to admit when we're not very good at something. Mm. And like, because play is so like visible to other people, like, I guess like if you're in a, if you're in a situation where like, everyone's like, oh, let's just all be really silly. And you're like, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> So I think it involves giving ourselves permission, doesn't it, to like show up in a particular way and to make sure that like we're comfortable with like not getting it perfect. If if your whole career has been about perfect performance, I always look my best. I always say the right thing. I always like, you know, take everything appropriately seriously. It can be quite hard to actually let go of that and be willing to like let it get a bit messy and like maybe I'll mess it up and maybe people will see a more vulnerable side of myself. So I don't know. I think that like, it's something that I am trying to get like really conscious about. But the thing that I'm finding really interesting is that a lot of women in my audience are struggling in the same way. And that's why I was like, I know that we have to, we have to have a conversation about this because like, it's something, it's, it's not good for us, I think, to, to just be like, oh, I, I shall never sort of connect with my inner child in that way. So I want to ask a quick follow-up call to that call question to that, Jessica, because what I want to know is what, to what detriment? So what do you feel like you are missing out on or what do you see in your awareness that could transform if you were to, to allow play to come into your life? And I want to know from Sarah and Manette then pre dating the time that you decided that play was important what did you realize looking back that you had missed out on or that you were, you know, mm. sacrificing, if you will? That's a great question. Sarah, like, what's mm -hmm. your what's your response to that? So I've never decided yeah. to play in my life. And I just I just didn't stop from oh, when I, love I was that. a kid. I wrote songs since I was a child. I have I did do a master's degree in philosophy and politics, and I was gonna go on to do a PhD. Yeah. Um but then my first album came out, and I think that uh, I've, I, it's, it's so interesting what you're talking about because when I started mentoring women musicians, um, I started noticing that spontaneity was the lack of spont fear of spontaneity was curtailing, like short circuiting their ability to express themselves. Mm. And the more I started noticing it, I started doing a little bit of research. What I found is in the UK um, that 82%, sorry, is it 80, 87% of professional songwriters and composers are men. So women are allowed to create music and they have the talent to create music and write songs, but they're still not doing it. And I wanted to know why. Like this was like an, a thing in my brain I couldn't turn off. And what I, I started to wonder is what stops people from playing because I think it's innate and natural mm. I don't think it's something you decide to do and sort of like like playing badminton on a Saturday or something it's completely innate because it's linked with being in the world and and and, and not being able to completely know everything and how you interact what, what I found showing up with a lot of the women I mentor in songwriting, poetry and art and, uh, and sort of generally is the fear underneath it. People pleasing, fear of making mistakes, fear of what will happen if you make a mistake, fear of public humiliation, fear of failure. Of course, these things are seldomly conscious. Mm. What you get is you get the person, as you mentioned, who hates play. I don't really believe it's possible to hate play. I, what I imagine may be the case is that you hate the, the fear that comes with the pressure of that. And mm -hmm. I think women in particular are still so gifted at getting ourselves in these massive knots <laughs> of what we're supposed to be um, that even paradoxically, when some women say, right, I'm an artist... That can become another layer of pressure where you go, I'm an artist. I've said I'm an artist. If I'm an artist, I have to produce. And of course, then that can block. So it's like this constant, like, dodging all these expectations 
that we place on ourselves and are, and are put on us um, in our culture. Mm. Yeah, I, I really like that, actually. And, like, I relate to that so strongly, if it's all right for me to just, like, jump in and, like, respond. Because um, I literally, like, I was in, like, a rock band when I was 18. It was a band that I started when I was 14. It was something that was so instinctive to me. It never occurred to me not to do that. And sometimes I just, I look back to my teenage self and I was like, she was awesome. You know, she did stuff. And, like, a massive sort of, personal growth thing for me has been sort of reconnecting with that version of myself and like I I had such a vision for my life then but then I quit my band I went to university I did a bachelor's degree I did a master's degree I got a corporate job like and I think I almost just like put that side of myself away and like mm -hmm. I would not allow myself to sing for the longest time and like I couldn't like I, I couldn't bear to sing in front of people whereas this year like like I said I've sort of I've been recording music for the first time in so long. And like one of my challenges to myself is like, I'm going to do a YouTube channel of me singing. And oh, it's going to happen. Fantastic. And Love it. even, but I think the thing with that is that even in that process, I've been like, but what's the point? Like, what's the point of that? What will it achieve? And it's like, well, it doesn't need to achieve anything because it's just about the expression. But I, I certainly, I totally relate to what you're saying, Sarah, there about kind of like, it's something that we don't allow ourselves to do because of like the levels of fear. It's a very vulnerable thing to say, I'm good at something because like the world is just waiting to be like, no, you're not, you're rubbish. So <laughs> I do think that- Well, we think the world is waiting to say that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we, by the way, we have Iris. Um, yes, who is watching I was just gonna too, say. Who is, yeah, who's um, commenting. She plays with her 15 month old pup and also writes music mm -hmm. and sings, plays guitar. Fantastic. And right. piano, like- it's awesome. and super bastardized that. piano she says <laughs> <laughs> so Manette what about you what <clears throat> what were you sacrificing or what what was going to the detriment prior to play so I loved everything and totally agree with everything that Sarah said just so right on point about what I see with other women and for me being a mom in a caregiving role and a business owner I had a big publishing company at the time, I didn't think there was any time or space for any kind of self-care. And for me, play is a form of radical self-care. And so I didn't think that I could find the opportunity for that. Like what would else would have to get sacrificed for me to do that? So I was really caught for a long time in that caregiving role. And as my kids got older, things got a little more spacious, business got a little bit easier. I started to rediscover some of those creative urges. And similar to Jessica, I found an old sketchbook from high school and I was really quite good. But if you would have asked me any time from high school to a, a couple of years ago, I would say, I can't draw, which is what everyone says when I say, oh, I'm you know super creative. And somebody said, oh, I love your work. I can't draw. Well, drawing has nothing to do with art or creativity, but that's an, another conversation for a different day. But what I realized was that drawing was my entry point back to play. And I had one teacher freshman year in university who basically told me not to waste my time on art classes. And it was an elective. I, you know, I already knew what my major was. I knew what was my direction. So all that creativity got channeled into writing, studying. I was, I've always been leading teams and groups and conferences and events for decades. It just went in different directions. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I discovered something called Zen Tingle, which is this beautiful meditative form of drawing. And it just brought me back to this is what's been missing. And I didn't even know right? I didn't know this was missing. And then once I started, I couldn't stop. And then I got uh, obsessive about that. Okay, and then it's not playful. Like my daughter one day said, mom, you painting is just like you working because I would save it for the weekends. It mm. wasn't integrated as part of my personal play practice on an ongoing basis. And all I had to do was just shift my thinking around, I've been an entrepreneur for over 20 years, like I own my schedule. No one can tell me not to paint at two o'clock in the afternoon if I want to. So why was I telling myself that, right? So learning to take play breaks throughout the day, five minutes of putting color on the paper, or dancing, or going for a quick walk, which for me is play, being outside in nature is play. I think we complicate play, thinking it has to have lots of rules and structure, 
but for me, play is about getting lost in process over product. And I mm -hmm. think Sarah was alluding to this is what she said as well, is that we fear happens when we're focused on the product and that I have to create something share worthy with yeah. others. That to me really shifts the energy out of play. And so mm -hmm. I have to pull myself back to process time after time again. And the play is in the process. It's never in the product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Juicy. Oh man. That I think, yeah, right there, getting lost in process over product and reminding ourselves to go back to the process. It's very easy to lose what we've, what we've seen and what our awareness has shown us and to get it trampled by habit and by, you know, years of beliefs and BS that we've been feeding ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think Jessica might have another question in mind, but I just want to say for those who are watching, we love questions too. So please just put those in the comments. We will, we'll keep our eye on those. But Jess, where would you like to move maneuver to next? Well, the question I had in mind um, is really like, what is a what is a good way to start allowing ourselves to experiment when, like, I, th I love what you said, Manette, because I think like that's exactly it, isn't it? And Sarah, you were absolutely touching on this too. Like, we get so obsessed with what the end result is going to be, and so then that kind of kills the sort of allowing ourselves to create so mm -hmm. what what would you say is like a good way to consciously disengage with like that obsession over like what's it going to be will it be good will people think it's good hmm um that's such a big question one thing that I personally do in my programs with with women is mm -hmm. I invite people to talk about Crazy. all the things that you uh, for instance in my career all the songs that you'll never hear because they didn't make it on the album or all the paintings that I've painted over because I decided I didn't like it anymore or, or poetry. So what you end up seeing in an artist's career is probably about 20% in my case of my output. Mm. And, 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 you know, when you look at the optics of a career that's in the marketplace, as it were, you know, I play festivals, I go on Women's Hour on Radio 4, I don't, you're kind of like, um, it, it looks as if it's competitive. But in the background, there is all that stuff going on. And there isn't a quick fix. I mean, there's some exercises you can do, but mainly it's a lot of mindset work. Hmm. It, it really is. And... For women, I think it can almost go almost like primordial, if that's the right word, um, in terms of it links with, I think, centuries and centuries of indoctrination about being marriage material and, and, and what that means to be um, not too much, you know, to be enough, but not too much, to... Um, to also, uh, you know, um, just be safe, safely pleasant and not to, because when you're playing, really playing, uh, I don't mean with rules, I mean just being in, in spontaneity, uh, you're, you're, you're not in a state where you're managing everything that you're expressing. You could start conveying all sorts <clears throat> of uh, feelings that you might wish you didn't have or that are not palatable to others, or that you think are not palatable to others. And so, so a, lot, a lot of the conversations or the work I do is actually about really digging deeply into that. And all the fears that come up with women, there's, I mean, it's not a one size fits all, but some of them, it's almost like, can I, eat? it gets to as basic as, can I be a wife and a mother and an artist? Or if I allow myself to do that, does that mean I'm never going to have stability? And when you start looking at female artists that are prevalent in our culture, they're often women who are kind of what I call like an anti-mother. Mm. You know, like think of like the, 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 the you know, Sylvia Plath or uh, Virginia Woolf or um, I know these kind of high art or even like Georgia O'Keeffe you know, the life of pain and exile of Frida Kahlo, you know, it's like, if you do your art, there's going to be a slight drawback for you. Yeah. Uh, is, 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 is a sort of a, a meme that has percolated 
into the collective imagination, in my opinion. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not laying this out as a thesis that I'm 100% behind, but it's the stuff that is getting churned up with some of the women I'm talking to. It gets that, it gets that deep. Now, I do certain things with people to sort of induce spontaneity. If they're a musician, I might get them to detune their instruments so they can no longer recognize the chords. So they're literally playing at it like a child would. I also get women to do abstract expressionist paintings on Zoom calls using anything around them, paint, crayon, ink, ketchup, soy sauce, glue, glitter, nail varnish, anything, and then photograph it. Because there's also, there's something about playing and then there's something about honoring what you've just done. And when you paint, you then put the painting I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, you know, with your art, if you take your painting and then you put it on the wall, it looks different because it's honoured. It's been given a place. Um, so there's there's quite a lot, even though I think this is a brilliant topic, by the way, everybody, because I think even though it's a one syllable short word that sounds like we all know what it means, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. Mm. Yeah. And I, I love that because it really is like a process, isn't it? It's not just like, well, here's the fix. And now that that's the answer. It's like, it's got to be a journey that you start going on and it can start very small. Mm -hmm. Minette, what would you add to that? Yeah. So I think that we have to go back to what it was like to play as a child and remember and crayons are such a, a great way, right? You open that box of crayons mm -hmm smell that crayon smell they have a very distinct smell right and like the you can't be perfect with crayons at all yeah. they're they're fat they're chunky so i love abstract yeah. expressive painting very similar to to sarah but if people are looking for where do i start coloring books are a great place to start and then coloring outside the lines mm -hmm. like, coloring awkward things like scribbling all over the page, I think is a really, really simple way to get started. But also taking a class, an improv class, a singing class, a creative writing class, something that stretches you outside of your normal, that allows you to get back into this space of, of not thinking and into creative being. Because so often we're so caught in our heads that we aren't in the experience of play, even in a playful environment. And so that spontaneity piece, I think is so important. But also this is, to me, play is very connected to intuition. Close your eyes and grab three crayons or markers out of a box and then make a picture with them on the page and mm -hmm. allow yourself to draw like a child. I think what I hear from people who want to start making art again is they expect to be Picasso or da Vinci right out of the gate, right? And they took lifetimes to, to build their skills. Sarah and I have taken lifetimes, as have Jessica and Megan, to build our, our artistry in our particular areas of genius. And I think also looking at all the ways that we're already creative that we don't acknowledge ourselves for. Cooking, gardening, entertaining, dress, designing our home. There's so many ways that we're expressing our creativity, but mm -hmm. because we get caught up in comparison all the time, uh, and I think I can't draw or I can't sing, then we get into that space of, well, I'm not creative. And we fail to honor all the ways that we already are mm. in that space of creative expression, which is playful. Like, I don't know about anybody else, but I could chop veggies for soup or salad for days, right? Like there's mm -hmm. something about chopping and seeing the colors on the cutting board and arranging a beautiful salad. It's like, I love cooking in a rainbow. So just those are, a, it's a way of connecting to our creativity. And first we just have to honor that we're already creative and then find ways that feel fun to sort of step out and try something new. Even those fun um, paint and sip places where you go drink a glass of wine and paint whatever the person tells you to paint by number is a way to get over the fear of the blank canvas. Taking a class or a workshop with Sarah, going to improv, 
watching Megan, like just sitting in the audience and laughing gets us back into that energy as well. Comedy clubs, improv shows, anything like that. A silly movie, watching babies laughing on YouTube, right? All these things that just remind us of the benefit of energetic play that moves energy in our bodies because that energy is all there. It's just trapped. Mm. And, you know, Manette, that's what I've <clears throat> appreciated most about being able to participate in your live workshops, either online or in person, is that there I... I struggle with the initial impetus. Like, where do I start? I have this blank page and, you know, there's nothing that you teach that is, here's the pattern that you are following. It is, here's the, here's the activity that we're going to do. Here's the first starting points. And then we get to go on our own in this, this beautiful creative direction. So there was a great question um, from I Iris. I love that question so much. Yeah. He said, how do we incorporate our art into our business? And I think we want to like dive into that. Can I start? Yes, please. Because I've been doing it for 20 years. So yes. um, I think it's there's so many fun ways, Iris. So I don't know what profession that you're in, but as Marketing. a business marketing brilliant so as a business coach for a decade my business plan looked like a mandala and people filled it out with markers and crayons so i think anytime you can bring um my first book has my artwork on the cover of the book and icons i hand drew throughout the inside of the book my workbooks always have coloring pages in them and i tell people Forget about trying to take massive amounts of notes. Go color a mandala and just listen. You'll absorb what you need and you'll feel so much more relaxed at the end of the workshop. So I think adding color, adding creative activities, adding more journaling prompts rather than just traditional marketing as someone who's been in marketing like everyone else for you know the last 20-ish years, right? I think there's so many ways to lighten that up and make it fun. But doing your, I don't know what kind of art you mean, but um, Jessica was talking about singing. Singing on stage when you're leading live events brings your creativity and art to the forefront. Megan does this spectacularly with her skits with Ron Ben Joseph at the Dames and all of the characters that she's created who are, I, I love the whole concept of edutainment because it is both playful, entertaining, and super, super creative. But I think looking at the ways that the art can support the learning in your community is a great way to start. And there's no limit on ways to bring art. Like, are your clients making vision boards? Sometimes it's that freaking simple to get people into their creative side and out of their thinking side. So coloring pages, using your own art illustrations, drawing cartoon characters instead of writing so many words in your workbooks. There's a lot of ways to just add white space, right, into everything that you're doing um, and to also let creativity. I loved Megan said this at the beginning when she started doing the art improv. She wasn't fire hosing people. People could really relate and connect and they bought more, right? Like people would come to my workshops expecting to be overwhelmed and find themselves walking away clear and relaxed like I'm sure they do from Sarah's. It's amazing. An abstract expressive painting could be the origin of an amazing song. Mm. Oops, Sarah, you're, you're muted. We'd love to hear your thoughts too. I was just agreeing with what you said. There was a delivery truck or something out there. Um, yeah, I was just completely agreeing with what you say. I mean, I, I, I think that, that creativity is an expansive energy. It makes everything grow. When, when, when women in particular are frustrated, they have that frustration. I always say like the frustration itself is lobbying you on behalf of your talent, you know, that you're not doing because of the fear stuff. So it, it just makes everything grow. And I started, I mean, I, I don't have anywhere near as much business experience as you guys, but I have, um, um, I accidentally started a business two years ago uh, during the pandemic when I started doing a songwriting mentorship program for women all over the world. Sorry, excuse me. That's it. Who are calling you right now on the phone. Uh, I think it's the door of the studio. Um, and uh, and then it just grew and grew and grew. And it's keep, you, you know, it's that thing about, um, I think creative thinking is like, 
really inventing your own rule book as you go. And it could be, and, and it could be in your humor, it could be in your art, it could be in your business, it could be in the ways that you magnetize income. It could be these things for me are all linked. When I had my business coaching that I had with my coaches in the United States, what happened was my career went even bit. I started getting offers for exhibitions. I started getting book offers. I was invited onto TV shows, radio shows, and I didn't know that, that it would have that knock-on effect. Mm. Because I think these things are not as compartmentalized as we're invited to imagine. They are really, really like this. Um, mm. And the more, the more um, free and creative people are, the people that women mainly that I work with, um, the more art they make and then the more money they make, you know, and the more, and the more freedom they have. And then the more art they make, and then the more money they yield, wield, and and so on. So um, it's in for me starting out. I'm I'm two years into uh, my business. I started an academy for creative women called the Create Now Academy, and it's like retreats and workshops and programs on top of my career. Um, it's it's just like a, 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 a like 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 you were saying, uh, Minette, about gardening. It's like having a plant and then going, "Whoa, look at it grow! Oh, it's flowering! <gasps> it smells amazing! Oh, what should I do now? Oh, it's a bit ill. I think I'll do this. I'll put it in a different window." And it's just it's just literally doing what you love without interruption, really. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> I, aspects, which is a privilege. And one that I, I really, really appreciate. <laughs> I'm hearing you, Sarah, if this is, I'm kind of trying to, to pull together this synopsis of like, the first step is trusting ourselves. And it's trusting that we, we well, first of all, expectations need to go out the window because we don't know what the heck it's going to look like. And <clears throat> it's allowing that spontaneity and that, actual creative energy to sprout. And so for you, Jessica, just in this, you know, I almost feel like it's even the approach to integrating mm. sing and song into your business can maybe let go of the how it needs to show up. Maybe it's not a YouTube channel. Maybe it's like starting to play with different ways that it can show up. And the more that you start playing with it and just I mean, I know this seems silly, but literally when I would go at Dame's events before I was doing sketch comedy, I would have the microphone and instead of just telling people to get back to their seats, I would invent songs and I would just have Amazing. songs coming out of my mouth mm -hmm. to get people back to their seats. And they thought it was hilarious because I was just playing, mm. but then like riffing in the moment. Yeah, exactly. Just riffing on it. So for you, it's like, how do you riff and how does mm. everyone who's listening to this riff with whatever your art form is, and you may not know your art form. So you may need to start trying singing and yeah. playing an instrument and pulling pen to paper and using Zen tangle as a way to untangle your brain. Or, you know, I can't think of any other forms right now or take an improv class. There's the big mm. obvious one, you know, take an improv class, those kinds of things to really just allow yourself to have no end byproduct that you are looking to create. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, that links really nicely to something that, like, as everyone was talking, I was like, oh, I'm curious about um, what you guys think about this. But the question of how we involve other people in our creativity, mm -hmm. like, how, like, do we have to be, like, public? So one of the reasons why, like, the YouTube channel is important for me is because I've been a secret singer for 20 years. And, mm -hmm. like, so it's really important for me, like, I think it's part of my, like, personal growth and development to just, like, get out there and be like, it doesn't matter what the consequences are, you need to start showing up as the singer that you are, because you know that you need to do it. So I'd be really curious, Minette and Sarah, like, what is your feeling? Like, does it matter if, if we perform to a crowd or we perform to ourselves? Like, what's, what, what are the things that we should be sort of aware of in that whole dynamic? I think that to start it can be just for you. Like it takes a lot of energy that can be so daunting in the beginning if you think that you're doing something for that product or for public consumption, it can stop us in our tracks and we overthink things. We get stuck in both procrastination and perfectionism. And, you know, 
things like creative play, if you don't get them going, at some point, they're just going to stall out and stay on the back burner. So for me, I have a huge part of my art practice that's just for me that never gets shared and doesn't need to be shared with anyone else. And on the opposite side of that, I think creating and playing in community is often the thing that gets us over the hump. Because like Megan said, that impetus of having a place to start, a prompt, an idea, a collective gathering, I find, and Sarah, I'm curious if you're finding this as well, that what women are longing for is creating in community, that mm -hmm. where we've suffered from isolation, we don't have, you know, quilting circles and sewing circles and gathering for tea and the things that women used to do in the past that would bring them together. Mm -hmm. And I think that creativity and the pandemic has been fascinating. It has brought so many people together into these online communities mm -hmm. that are seeking that connection. And now I'm seeing it go back to the longing to be in person again. But I have a lot of women say to me that I never do it at home by myself. I have to have a class or a retreat or an experience right? Or they show up in, at one of my retreats, like the one Megan was at, I didn't know how much I needed this. So oftentimes, I think there's benefit to creating home alone, because it feels safe. And there's benefit to creating in community. And in both cases, it's unattached to what the potential outcome is. I love that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I, I like to think that you're, you're saying to Adele, please be quiet. I'm doing no, something. No, no. Well, I'm, saying, it's, uh, I'm saying to my partner, love, please, could you get my charger that's in my black yeah, bag? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, you, what, it's really interesting what you're saying. I think that um, um, what community is given the women that I've been working with is um, the experience of seeing that their fears are not bespoke to them. And then as we all do in any kind of group activity, you see somebody else win or you see somebody else struggle and it, it humanizes the whole process. Um, and, and, and this is crucial for the women that I work with in terms of their, their growth and their courage to break through all the fear that stops them from doing the thing in the first place. Um, so, and so, so sometimes it's, uh, and back to the question, of course you don't, you don't have, no one has to perform anything. You can do this completely, um, you know, on your, for your, on your own volition for yourself. Um, you know, it's more that, um, it's more that it, it's, it's more an issue of to what degree the fear is, is, is running the show. Mm. Because often people might not want they you might say I don't want to perform, but why don't you want to perform? Mm. Um, because perfectionism is coming up and perfectionism yep. is saying, no, here's your stopping point because you don't have everything so perfectly laid out. Mm. So Jessica, you've already gone through those initial stages of playing with it, you know, ideating around it. You've been mm. singing in the shower, so to speak, mm. you know, playing in your own home studio. And you know that the next step for you is to play publicly, to, mm. to have this expo, you know, out to other people. I, I think that what's important here is that we've all probably tapped into our intuition without even knowing it. And that is what has helped us create the expression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I was asking myself for years, you know, what what is it that is not being expressed in myself as my soul? Like, what am I, what am I not expressing? And I had said for years, I want to take improv classes. I'd said mm -hmm. it for years. And at one point my husband was just like, instead of asking, he just bought me a ticket to, you know, for the first class that I needed to take. And he paid for it for me for Christmas. And it was like, wow. That was, that was such a domino for me, but listen to what you're telling yourself. Listen to what you're saying to yourself. You're probably already giving yourself the answer as to how you could integrate play in. And then you've probably have the other devil on the shoulder saying, you shouldn't do that. That's not a good mm. use of your time. That's not going to help mm -hmm. your business. Blah, blah, bullshit. So, excuse me, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I, I think that we can really just say, peel back those layers of self-doubt, self peel back those layers of self-judgment and say, what is it that I really want? How do I want to express this? And how can I just itsy bitsy spider take movements toward mm. that? 
Yeah, and I, I think for for everyone listening to this, you might have a particular calling to a certain like creative outlet. Like we are all uniquely gifted. And so it, it may be that your thing isn't music when it's not art, but like it might be gardening or it might be like home decoration or like, you know, whatever it is. I, I love what you're saying there, Megan, about sort of tying that to intuition because I think we get these prompts, don't we? As creative, like we all have, some people are like really creative, but we all have like creative, like, prompts throughout our lives it's really what we do with that whether we squash it down and say I don't do that anymore or I'm not the kind of person who does that or that's not productive enough for me or whether we're just open to like what could this what could this mean for me what could this cause me to be able to express and like result in a shared experience I I think that listening to that and knowing that actually it's okay to experiment with it. It's okay to try. It's okay to, for it to have no outcome or no, you know, never even see the light of day. It really does, like, it starts at that kind of, that prompt, that spark. Like, are you going to allow that or are you going to squash it down? Mm-hmm. Can I tell you guys, there's a really great quote from the um, that uh, Ken Robinson, the educationalist, and, and he said uh, something that I love, which is, uh, uh, probably not verbatim, but to be creative, you don't have to not be scared of making mistakes, but you need to be prepared to. You need to be prepared to be wrong. And and that doesn't mean that you're not frightened of it, but you have to be prepared for it because mm. uh, if not, you're, you're not going to do that. And, and there is a cost. I can see there is a cost of not doing that in so many ways. Mm. Mm. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Sarah. Now, um, we have, we've run out of time. It's time for us to wrap up. Okay. Um, Sarah and Manette, it would be great for you to share with our audience, like, where can people find you if they want to know more about what you do? Manette, you go first. Yeah, thank you. So my website is my name. It's MinetteRyerden.com. I spend most of my time online on Instagram at Dr. Minette Riordan, where I post a lot about my art and different programs and um, have a lot of free courses at Minette.teachable.com as well that people can check out. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. Um, I am also at SarahGillespie.com. Um, although we are also just we are also starting up another website which is the create now academy.com or org I should know that and I don't uh, but basically if you google me there's lots of stuff there's lots of music and um, you know my, my concerts and um, uh, all of my programs free workshops communities and gigs and everything is all there online amazing yeah. And can I ask a quick question? What's one final short tip that you have for women about play? And yeah, go ahead. Go, Manette. <laughs> one short tip I have for women about play, um, I would say first, really connect to the sense of childlike play. What did you enjoy as a kid? Because I think we need to remember what play means to us. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And Sarah? This reminds me of um, uh, the the take on the um, famous philosophy adage, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And Jacques Lacan, one of my favorite philosophers, said, he twisted it and said, I am where I do not think. And for me, that's a beautiful kind of gateway into that, the idea that your real being is where you are not thinking where you are playing and and what comes out of that can be magical Mm -hmm. absolutely magical in in many many ways so not a very small quote but yeah beautiful (laughs) that that is beautiful awesome jessica what would you like to add to close us out today Well, I just want to say if you are watching this and you are becoming all about play or you're thinking, do you know what? I would love to get better at doing that. The Dames is a brilliant community to be a part of. Megan is their queen. (laughs) And Megan, where can people find out more about the Dames if they so desire? Yes, we would love to have you check us out if you're a woman who's running her own six or seven figure business 
or a woman in a director and higher position of a large organization, come play with us. Check out our the humor that we bring, the love that we bring, the the unique community at the dames.co forward slash round table. You can come join one of our experiential free events online from anywhere in the world. And if you are a six-figure business owner looking to grow to seven figures and you would like to stop being stuck and start actually making movement toward that seven-figure goal, I suggest checking out Jessica Fearnley. And how can they find out more about you, my friend? Uh, well, if you go to jessicafearnley.com, which is my website, but connect with me on LinkedIn. Don't just press follow, like actually do a connect and like send me a little note, like let's have a conversation um, because like connect with all of us. That would be an awesome thing to do. Uh, but so often like my relationships, with my clients, they start off in those early um, messages on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, we'll go to my website where you can find out more about my podcast. Um, to be honest, keep watching LinkedIn because I'm planning to do a ton more video on LinkedIn um, this year, um, part of my my creative endeavors and visibility and all that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we'll be coming back next month in July with another amazing action packed episode of the Megan and Jessica show for you all. So thank you everyone for being part of this. Thank you, Minette and Sarah for being our guests today. It's just been awesome what you have shared. And yeah. I know that so many people will get so much out of this. So thank you for being with us today. Thanks absolutely. Thanks, thanks for having for us. Yeah. Thank you for showing up fully. And Jessica, thank you for your expertise and your LinkedIn prowess, giving us access to LinkedIn <laughs> audio, which we otherwise wouldn't have access to. This is always a fun thing. So thank you all. And please do connect with us everywhere online. Have a beautiful day. Yay. Bye.